types of questions, aren't you? That what uh, what we need to do when it seems like our prayers have failed or they've gone unanswered. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. And we'll read verses 41 through 46. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 18, verses 41 through 46. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stopped thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with the clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening, and Lord, we do come to you because that we need instructions concerning prayer or we need to learn uh, how to pray. And we're so glad that when we come to the Bible that, Lord, you give us uh, uh, a clear answer uh, to even the difficulties that we face when we pray. And, Lord, when we pray and there, receive, there seems to be nothing, Lord, we're so glad that your word addresses that. And, and we, we have gained help and strength because of your word. And we pray, God, that the Spirit of the Lord would help every single Christian in the service tonight. And, Lord, I pray that you would affect us. And, Lord, help us that we uh, might not be discouraged in our prayer life, but that we might be strengthened because of the testimony and teaching that we find in your holy word. Lord, help us this evening. Speak to our hearts. And Lord, help us to grow, help us to grow in our knowledge of you and our knowledge of prayer. And Lord, help us to be more men and women of prayer that we might please you with our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Well, last month we uh, tried to look at uh, some of the teachings the Bible has on the doctrine of prayer. And in fact, uh, we enjoyed a week of prayer, and I'm not using the word enjoyed lightly. Uh, we really were uh, blessed of the Lord to be able to meet nightly and as a church gather before the Lord in prayer. And many of us uh, felt uh, assurance that God had heard and answered our specific request. Um, I'm not going to get you to uh, actually raise your hand, but I'm confident that if I asked you to, there would be several that could raise their hand and say, I know God heard uh, my prayer and that I have received an answer, an assurance of an answer uh, that is to come. And often when we have that sense of, I know God is going to do this, and then we don't see an immediate answer if we're not careful, that could be a discouraging time uh, for those who are learning, especially to call upon the name of the Lord and learning how uh, to pray. But one of the things I do want to remind you before we look exactly at this uh, subject is that it's always good to pray, and God does always hear. He always does hear prayer. Amen? Uh, prayer is never a waste of time, what I want to get across to you. It's always good to pray, and you can always be assured that God has heard your prayer and that God will answer your prayer. And so I want to come to God's Word again this evening and hopefully help you by seeing 
What are we to do when, like Elijah, when he prays and he sends the servant out and the servant comes back and said, well, I've got news for you, there's nothing. (laughs) What are we to do when we pray and there seems to be nothing? First of all, when prayer seems to fail, make sure that you keep on asking in faith. I think that's a mistake that we make sometimes. We are, when we're praying, we have such assurance and confidence that God is going to do it. And then when we don't see an immediate answer, if we're not careful, our faith turns to unbelief. Well, John, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you agree with me on that? Even our Christian faith, we're not taught in the Scriptures that our faith in Christ is a one-time expression of belief. That's not what biblical salvation is. Well, I believed years ago that Christ did this, so because I believe that years ago I have eternal life. That's not the teaching of the Bible. Our faith is an ongoing, continuing belief. We believe as much today as the day that we were saved that Christ died on the cross and that we have eternal life through His shed blood. And prayer is to be a a continual belief in or an expectation for the answer that is coming. God has promised to answer and so there's to be an ongoing expectation to that answer. Faith is not offering up one prayer, one time, never to be prayed about again. And by the way, sometimes you'll run into Christians that will tell you if that's really a prayer of faith, you pray about it one time, and that's the end of it. And all you have to do is read through your Bible, and you'll see that is not what the Bible teaches at all. Real faith holds on to God. Real faith keeps trusting in God. Real biblical faith keeps believing. It keeps believing in God. It keeps anticipating an answer. It's not that we are to just to have faith for a little period of time that the answer will come. And by the way, that's why Satan tries to attack us immediately after victories of faith because he wants to change that belief back into unbelief. And so one of the things that you need to remember is that prayer is to be continued in a faithful expectation that an answer is going to come. Elijah's prayer certainly teaches us this, doesn't it? Remember, Elijah was the one that prophesied it would not rain for three and a half years, and it had not rained in the land of Israel for that long period of time. In fact, no dew was even upon the ground. And immediately after idolatry was dealt with, it wouldn't completely be destroyed, but it was dealt a a significant blow. Uh, 400 prophets of Baal were slain, Uh, it was evident that Elijah's God was the true and living God. Now God is going to send rain. (laughs) He's going to send the rain. In fact, the statement Elijah makes in verse 41 is a statement of faith. God has assured Elijah that the rain is on the way. And so Elijah curls up into a ball. I hope you get the picture here. He puts his face between his feet much like an infant child in his mother's womb. Really, what a great position of prayer. A child is absolutely dependent upon its mother for everything while he's in that womb. And that's really what prayer is, absolute dependence upon God as an infant in the womb, womb crying out to God Uh, that God alone can send the rain, that's the prayer that Elijah is offering up. But after Elijah pours out his heart in in humble, earnest prayer, remember what James tells us about the prayer life of Elijah. This wasn't, oh, Lord, would you please send the rain. It was, oh, God, with my whole heart, my 
mine. My, I'm engaged. I'm earnest. Lord, uh, pour out those showers so Israel will know and it will be reaffirmed that you are God. Go and see now, servant, if anything's changed. <laughs> Is there any sign at all that it's going to rain? When Elijah looked up, the skies were clear blue. And servant ran, looked out toward the sea and came back with this uh, maybe unexpected report, but no doubt shocking report. Uh, the servant said, there's nothing at all. No rain clouds. No sign of rain coming. There is nothing. And so Elijah just gets off Mount Carmel and goes about his business. No. He gets back in that fetal position and he begins again to earnestly cry out in earnest prayer, God, send the rain. It's, we are a needy people. Uh, demonstrate, Yahweh, your power. And if you, this is abbreviated, but you can see that he tells the servant to go again and the report comes back, nothing, and go again. And the report comes back, nothing. And so more earnest prayer, more agonizing in prayer, more crying out to God, go serve it again and look. And six times he comes back with the same report, nothing, 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 nothing. And sometimes when you pray, it will appear to be the same way when you pray. You, you believe, you know that God has heard you, but when you look around, things have not changed. In fact, some indications are they are worse off. <laughs> it keeps going in the wrong direction. It's always kind of amused. It amazed me when I was a younger Christian and then it has got to the place where it amuses me now because it's almost an expected thing. The devil uses the same old tired tricks. After an exceptional time of great spiritual blessing, just know, write it down, the very next thing will be a downturn, a depressing event. Uh, uh, it looks like it will go in the totally wrong direction, like God had ignored everything you said and nothing, there is no God. It will look like that. And if you're not careful, your faith will dip down very low as Satan whispers in your ear, see, God doesn't really hear and answer prayer. And he wants you to get in agreement with him. Satan wants you to get in agreement with him and say, well, it was just a waste of time. <laughs> and that's why over and over and over in the Bible, God presses this matter upon us in different biblical passages to continue to help us to know that we're not to give up, we're not to quit, we're not to cease praying, we're to continue to ask until the answer is in our hands, as it were. Until the servant comes back and says, hey, guess what I saw? It's not big. It's not impressive. <laughs> it's not major storm clouds. It's a teeny little cloud. But that was enough to give the prophet assurance that the abundance of rain was on the way. So don't let not getting an immediate answer discourage you from continuing to pray in faith, believing. And by the way, don't just take my word for this. Go back to the Bible and see that the Creator of all things has told you this over and over and over again so that you would not quit asking in faith. Remember, one of the most amazing passages concerning this is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 15. It's amazing because Matthew records that 
request from the Canaanitish woman. She has a daughter that is possessed by a demon. And that lady, that mother, comes to Jesus and in Matthew 15, 22, she cries out, this is her words, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. And she knows this is the Messiah, this is Christ, this is the promised one. She is saying every right thing about Jesus. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, thou son of David. Listen, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She's not just not, she, it's not that she just can't sleep at night. She is being tormented by your enemies. Demons are tormenting her. And to our shock and surprise, Verse 23 says these words, but he answered her not a word. He did not even acknowledge that she had said one single thing to him. And sometimes when you're praying, it's the exact same way. You can pour out your heart and it will be as though God has not said a word that he hasn't even heard your cry isn't that true and then the Bible goes on to teach us that she began to uh, pester the disciples again I think this is an abbreviated thing I think she went to Peter and said Peter you've got to help me I've, I've asked the Lord if he would have mercy on my daughter and he he didn't say a word. He didn't look my way. There was no response at all. Peter, please, could you do something? And Peter doesn't really help. And so James and John, and, and she goes to Thomas, and she's going through all of them, and finally the disciples said, Lord, she is, she is really bothering us. And to them, Jesus says something. <laughs> Not to her, Still not to this lady, but he says something to them. And as soon as he speaks to them, Jesus answered his disciples. And as soon as he speaks to them, she sees an open door. He said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of Israel. The people of God, that's who I'm sent to. And as soon as he opens up just a little bit, she runs and falls at his feet. And Jesus said, woman, I can't give the uh, children, that, the bread that belongs to the children to dogs. And how many of you would have heard that and got up and walked away in a huff? And she said, yes, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he said, woman, great is thy faith. Be it be it as unto you. Whatever you believe, you've got it, lady. You've got great faith. And and by the way, sometimes to get answers, we have to have that type of persistent faith that just continues to believe when there, it seems to be everything in you says it's impossible for this to ever happen. Everything I've tried, the Lord doesn't look my way. The disciples are turning me. I get a, a a word of strong rebuke but it did not dissuade her faith at all. It just increased her cry, her intensity, until the Lord grants her request. He does lay bread down, doesn't he? Amen? (laughs) And meets this need. And she goes home and she finds that her daughter is made whole. Or about the many other stories we hear along these lines. Remember Luke chapter 11, when Jesus tells about the friend at midnight... Verses 5 through 8, you might want to write these verses down, go back later on, re-look at them, pray over them again. He comes at night, I have someone visiting, a friend of mine, who don't have any bread in the house, could you give me some bread? And the, the guy says, no, I, I and my children are in bed, I'm not going to get up and give you bread. I need bread, I've got a need, I, go away, it's too late, it's midnight, I'm not going to help you. 
You don't understand. I can't leave until I get some bread. I'm sorry. I'm not getting up. Hey, I need bread. Go away. And it says finally, he's not going to get up because it's his friend. Now many of you would say, if my friend was out there and was in need, I would get up if it was my friend. But the Bible said not because that it was his friend, but because of his importunity, his continual knocking. And so what do we need to do when it seems like prayer has failed? <laughs> Don't quit knocking. <laughs> Don't quit asking. Don't quit looking. Don't quit expecting. Don't quit sending the servant to say, hey, is there any sign? Don't quit looking for the answer. Amen? What about Luke chapter 18 and the unjust judge? You see, all these all these parables, all these stories, if something is said twice in the Bible, it's very significant. God wants us to pay special attention to it. But this is one of those topics that say, stated over and over and over. It's such a vital um, issue. It's so important. You have to learn this. You can't miss it. It's essential when, it, when you deal with prayer. Don't give up. And so when you don't get, seem to get an answer, when it looks like prayer has failed, keep asking in faith. Secondly, when prayer seems to fail, make sure that you're not praying contrary to God's will. You know, sometimes we're, we don't get what we really want because it's simply not the will of God that we should possess that. And sometimes that's hard for us to accept. But it's often true. God does not work the same way in every circumstance or situation in what is God's will for one man may not be God's will for the next individual. Amen? And just because God was gracious to answer this prayer concerning this need is not a guarantee that God is always going to answer that prayer concerning that same need the same way. Remember, Vicky sings a song sometimes about the greatest yes is a no. How's, the, how's that word go when, when God doesn't send you the yes? Sometimes the no is a better yes, right? When God said, I'm not going to allow that, why? Because I have something better, something more needful. And, listen to me, often we have to acknowledge it's just simply not God's will for us to have this. God is not going to give that that's not His will. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter number 3? Deuteronomy chapter number 3. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to remind you of this passage. Remember, they're getting ready to go into the promised land and Moses, that man that had such an intimate relationship with God, he begins to come to the Lord again about crossing over into the Jordan and going into the promised land. Remember now, he, he, he spoke to the rock, or he smote the rock, and then he was supposed to speak to the rock, and he smote it the second time. And in, it's a type of someone crucifying Jesus afresh and anew. And so he can't enter the promised land because he didn't speak to the rock, he smote the rock. And so Moses is praying. And listen to me, the reason Moses keeps praying about this is because he knows that most of the time God says yes. How many things have been drastically changed? God said, this is my will. And Moses fell on his face. And God said, okay, I'll, I'll not do that. <laughs> and so he knows that God normally says yes. And so with this issue, he is... He is, in, he is a, uh, encouraged because of God's willingness to say yes to keep bringing this up and maybe God will change his mind about this also but read with me in Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 23 and I besought the Lord at that time saying 
O Lord God, Thou hast begun to show Thy servant Thy greatness and Thy mighty hand for what God is there in heaven or on earth that can do according to Thy works and according to Thy might. I pray Thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain and Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. And then he said, You go up on the mountain and I'll show you the land. You can't cross over. It's not my will. But I'll take you to a mountain and I'll let you look at it. (laughs) But you can't cross. It's just... Not my will. And sometimes when we're praying about something, we have to understand it's not always God's will. Listen to me. This is hard for us, but it's not always God's will to heal either. Right? Sometimes God heals in just miraculous ways, and then sometimes God does not heal. And regardless of what the charismatic and Pentecostal people say, it's not always the will of God to heal Everybody, if it was, nobody would ever die. Right? So sometimes it is God's will that even Christians suffer in the flesh. Remember also 2 Samuel chapter number 12. David had sinned. This is probably some of the saddest pages in our Bible. This godly man, David, has sinned against the Lord, broken God's heart, and and the lady that he had adultery with is with child, and the prophet says to David, David, that child is not going to live. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sins, Thou shalt not die, how be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child of Uriah's wife, Uriah's bare, wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. Now notice verse 16, David therefore besought God for the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. The elders of his house arose and went to him to rise him from the earth, but he would not. They said, David, get up, come and get something to eat. He said, no, leave me alone. I cannot. I cannot let go of God. I want God to spare the child. It's not the child's fault. I was the one that sinned. It, it's my fault. If anybody should be punished, it should be me. And you can tell by their tenderness around David, it was a terrifying time. Verse 18, And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And David arose and and he ate. And later on they said, David, why are you, now why are you getting up and not fasting, not crying out? What's going on? And he ended it by saying, I can't go to the child. While he was alive I thought God might spare him but now he is dead and and I I couldn't change it because of prayer verse 23 but now he's dead the child wherefore should I fast can I bring him back again the answer is no I shall go to him but he shall not return to me you see all the earnest prayer and David was a man of prayer David knew how to pray. He was not a stranger to prayer. He was not a stranger to getting great answers from God. But when it came to this issue in his life, God had said 
no. And no amount of praying was going to change this no that David had received of the Lord. Those seem to be some difficult examples, some hard examples to consider Moses and David, but even our Lord, remember, in Matthew chapter 26, He is going to the cross and facing that cross that He would die for the sins of the world. And He calls His disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and He says, guys, you pray. He gets Peter, James, and John, takes them a little further and says, listen, I'm in great agony. Pray for me. Pray with me. He goes a little further, gets alone with his father, and he says, God, Father, if if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And by the way, this was great agony in prayer. Remember how the Bible describes it? It was great blood droplets pouring out of his flesh as he agonized in prayer. You say, was he that fearful of the cross? It wasn't the cross, it wasn't the pain, it was the fact that he was going to take your sin and my sin. And then he goes back and he gets back to his men, they're asleep, he wakes them up, and then he goes back and he prays again. He goes back and he wakes the men up, and he goes back a third time and he prays again. If there's any other way if it's possible, if if salvation could be brought through any other means. And God said, Son, no, there's no other way. This has to be the way. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but Thy will be done. And sometimes we have to get to that in our praying, don't we? It's not that we change our prayer. It's not that we... Uh, cast in belief and faith and forsake that it is maybe that God through petitions and through prayer reveals to us that that you're praying for is not my specific will for your life and there are times that our prayers need to change right as God reveals to us hey that is not according to my will And, and I think James touches on this when he says you ask and have not because you ask to miss to consume it upon your own lust. But these are not lustful things necessarily. These are, these are issues that are near to the heart. And sometimes it's just not God's will that we get those things that we're asking God for. It doesn't mean that God is, does not hear and answer prayer, right? And then thirdly, think about this. When you pray and prayer seems to fail, make sure that you're willing to accept the answer that God gives. And so often we expect that God is going to answer this way. Right? We ask for this. And so God has to answer it this way. (laughs) And so we're looking that it would come this way. And it's not the way that God's going to answer our prayer. It doesn't mean that God's trying to deceive us. He's not being dishonest or He's not being uh, speaking guile when He makes great promises concerning prayer. It's sometimes He gives the answer and the answer is, is not the answer that we're going to expect. Remember, Paul was a good example of that, wasn't it? Paul prayed and he got an answer but it wasn't the answer that he was looking for. Is that right? Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, Paul has this weakness in his body, this thorn in his flesh. It's hindering him as far as he's able to understand. It's hindering me from doing the work that I want to do for my Savior. If I didn't have this thorn in my flesh, wow, what kind of stuff I could do. And so he carries that to God three times. See how many examples we have? Don't you pray? Don't let anybody convince you you pray about it one time and forget about it. Here's Paul praying about this situation three times. He said, I sought the Lord thrice that he would take this thorn out of my flesh. And, 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 you know, people have tried to decide what is that thorn? And I'm glad he just said a thorn because it covers so many things that you might be facing. It may be physical back pain. It may be eye problems. It may be some other 
like epilepsy, epilepsy or something like that. It may be some issue like that. And I'm glad that anybody reading that could say, wow, I have a thorn in my flesh. It's a co-worker. <laughs> There's so many things that you could apply that to, but God said, listen, Paul, I'm not going to remove that. You need that. He got the answer. The answer was clear. The answer came. There was no mistake in that God had addressed the prayers that Paul offered up, right? But it wasn't answered the way that Paul was expecting. Paul was expecting, yes, I'll just take the thorn out. But most of you are so familiar with that story, you know that that thorn was essential to make Paul the man that he was. And so when you're praying and it seems like prayer has failed, don't listen to the liar. Don't listen to the father of lies. Don't, don't cast in your faith when just because there wasn't an immediate answer that came the way you thought that it should come, Right? I don't know how many times we've prayed about needs here at our church, and God has met needs in this church in various ways. It hasn't always been the same way. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad that it's that way, aren't you? Because God shows, listen, I don't need one way as a resource. I don't need just this as the only way that I can meet your need. I can meet your need in a multitude of ways. And so God is answering. God will answer. Are you willing to accept the answer that He gives? Sometimes the answer is this, and we don't like this either. I don't know how many of you like to be told no. Do you like to be told no? Not many of us like that answer, but sometimes the answer we get from earnest prayer is... No, I'm not going to do that. And what did Paul, the answer Paul got was not a yes, but a no, but he got an answer. I'm not going to take the thorn away. Why? Because if I took the thorn away, you would be strengthened physically, but weakened spiritually. And Paul, I, don't, I, can't, I can't use that. What I need is for you to be weak physically so that you could be spiritually strong and when Paul saw the glorious answer, he said something that has bewildered all of us. He said, well, I'll most gladly, therefore, glory in my infirmities. Instead of praying the thorn is removed, I'm going to start saying, thank God for thorns. Hallelujah for thorns. Praise God for my weakness in my flesh because it gives me power to do God's work. And just because the answer doesn't come immediately, don't you dare quit praying. It may take three more prayers. It may take seven more prayers. It may take a couple more years. It may take seven more years. It may take your entire life. You don't like hearing that, do you? What if it took your entire life to get this answer you say, well, I'm just not willing to wait that long. Well, maybe that's the reason you're not getting the answer. Maybe if you would surrender to God's will and say, God, it's in your hands. I know that you're the all-wise God. You know all things. You don't make any mistakes. Your ways are always right. But, Lord, I really desire this. And, Lord, if you'll bring the answer tomorrow or next week or next year or ten years from now, Lord, I just want this answer. I'm, I'm always uh, impressed and encouraged and amazed by the prayers of George Mueller. And some of those prayers, he recorded a multitude of prayers that God answered for him. And there's hundreds that God answered immediately in the day the prayer was offered. And he has them written out and recorded. But then there are some prayers that he prayed every day his entire life that he never saw answered in his lifetime. Remember I shared with you about how he prayed for his brother, that his brother would be saved. 
For 60 some odd years he prayed every day that his brother would be saved and then he died and he never saw his brother come to faith in Christ. And then two years after his death his brother got saved. And it may be that we're not getting an answer is because that we're not committed. Lord, I know this is your will and I know it's right. Lord, I can't let go. I can't just quit praying. I can't quit believing. You promised that you're going to send rain. And that's here's Elijah. That's the, God has given the promise. Go tell Ahab it's it, the sound of abundance of rain. And I can't quit. God said rain's coming. I need to see an answer. And so he kept praying until the answer came. That's what I want to encourage you to do. Amen? Don't make the mistake of dropping those important prayers and letting them drift back here to forgetful prayers that you don't ever hardly mention again. Keep earnestly praying. Pray for strength to keep praying. Until God, listen, God will give you an assurance of an answer. Amen? And even in that assurance of an answer, you keep persisting forward until you see Maybe nothing but the, a cloud about the size of a man's hand, but you know the answer's on its way. Amen? Is that helpful to know these passages? Write them down. Go back and look at them again. What to do when it looks like that your prayers have just failed? Keep praying. Make sure that you're not praying contrary to God's will. And look for that prayer to be answered in any way it pleases God. It don't have to be answered the way that you thought it was. Maybe in some other way that pleases God. Amen? Let's stand for prayer.